Got 20 seconds. I'm on a man to go. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Good. Get those knees up. Explode. Good. Explode. Let's go. Up. Drop four. Let's go. One more. Up. You are listening to the Fight Strength Podcast with your hosts, Phil DeRue and Jason Burgos. What is up, fitness and fight fans, and welcome back for a new edition of the Fight Strength Podcast. I am Jason Burgos, and with me as always is my co-host, strength and conditioning coach to many of the stars of our American top team like Will Brooks, Alexi Olenek, and Joanna Yoncecic. He's the weightlifting competition winner, Phil the Gardner Daru. Phil, mm. what is up? <laughs> okay, so we got jokes on episode six. This is my episode, man. You can't be joking, calling me the Gardner. Listen, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm trying to diversify. I'm trying to show that you like this multi-skilled. You know, mm. you care about the the world and Earth and Mother Earth. What's yeah. wrong with that? I can diversify. I like it. There you but go. See, that's not bad. <laughs> all right now so for listeners you can check out all of our previous episodes by searching the show's name on itunes soundcloud youtube and google play you know for the return customer you already know how we do it also i wanted to mention for our television and wrestling fans out there you can check out a recent write-up i did for uh, pwpnation.com reviewing the netflix tv show glow it's a pretty good show you might want to check it out if you're into that now this episode of the show will be one big ask daru segment we have gotten a lot of questions from listeners of late, so we felt the need to just do a whole episode to address them and let Phil just, you know, showcase how amazing, fantastic, just the wealth of knowledge he has on this, you know, the training and strength and conditioning business and all those 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 nuances. Now, uh, the first question is from Chris from Vegas. He asks, "What are your thoughts on weightlifting straps?" Any are there any accessories or musts you recommend? So weightlifting straps can be useful. It depends on what you're trying to go for, what your goals are. Uh, if you're really trying to maximize your your potential as far as just maximum strength output and grip strength and work on your grip strength, then I would ditch the the straps for now. But if your main goal is to work on you know let's say hypertrophy for instance, if you want to uh, you know very Hit, put a hit point and and uh, really hit on a particular muscle without having to worry about your grips giving out then you can go ahead and throw on the straps and go from there also if you're doing like heavy deadlifts and you've done you know a, a endless amount of volume after you know your fifth or sixth set of heavy intense volume you're going to want to throw on those straps just so you can still get technically efficient and and go through the movement properly but also lift the weight as as efficient as possible but you know not tear up your hands because i've done that you know many times before where i'm on my sixth or seventh set and basically i just don't even have the grip strength anymore because my hands are just raw so i mean i definitely feel the need or the purpose for it it's understandable at this at the right times now for accessory work for anything i always say you want to develop good posterior chain strength and uh anterior core strength if you have that in place, then you're going to go far. You're going to be able to, to definitely um, improve in, in all in all sports performance. Now, I mean, now if anybody follows Phil on, on Instagram or Twitter, now he recently put up a video where I saw you were like doing, you know, lifting heavy weights, and then you had straps connected to them. Were those weight lifting straps? Like, what, what was yeah. that whole process you were working on? Yeah. So the that was one of my last sets. So like, like I said, we did. You, you actually warm up. I, my warm up usually takes around 30 minutes just because we have to warm up to our working set. And the, the heavier a lifter you are, the, you know, the more pounds you can put on the, on the bar, the longer it's going to take you to get to your working set. So if I'm doing warm ups, you know, for 30 minutes and then I go to my working sets and then by that time, it's about an hour into my training session while I'm grabbing the bar and picking it up every time, you know, your hands kind of get, you know, basically calloused up. My hands look like uh, like I've been playing in concrete all day, Oof. you know, but but so at the end of that, after the hour, you go into your supplemental work where you're kind of working on technically technical efficiency from the lift itself. But, um, you know, at that point in time, your hands are just raw. So, I mean, I just threw on the straps to help me stay, you know, with good form without having to worry about my hands, you know, basically tearing apart um, and still be able to lift as, as much weight as I need to for that set. 
No, I mean, you're, you're an expert in recovery and, and when you're doing a workout and even a, a fighter's cutting weight and recovering from that. How do you recover from just beat hands? I mean, do you good, do you use a good lotion? You know, is, is Jergens <laughs> the preferred brand you want to go with? Man, listen. If, <laughs> listen, if you got soft hands, you don't have man hands. Let me just tell you that right now. So guess what, Jason? Go rub your hands with some pebbles right now. Just go ahead and rub it in some rocks. Put them together. You'll be fine because if I if I when I see you, and I'll see you in Connecticut too. We're going, we're going to Bellator. <laughs> now, if I see you, I shake your hand, and it feels like my wife's hands. We got a problem. What? I mean, it's nice having nice soft. I mean, that should be nice for you. You know, nice soft hand. It's a friendly I handshake. You, I, don't, I don't need you having soft hands, man. I don't want you. To, that's, no, I'm good. Listen, you're not gonna give me any massages anytime soon. I'm good. All right, all right, fair enough. Fair enough. All right. <laughs> all right. Now, George in Atlanta asks. For an M- for MMA training for an MMA training camp, do you remove any and all weightlifting one week out from the fight, or two weeks, or ten days out? In your opinion, what is optimal to taper and peak right? Okay, so now this is entirely different. Now in the fight game, when you're a week out, all training must be completely specific, or uh, specific, or have a specificity in mind. So all strenuous weight training should be should be about over. Um, if you have to make weight, then that's you know that's the main focus for that week. Um, we'll be we'll be basically worrying about getting that weight down, making sure that you're feeling good, you know, water loads and things like that. But I usually cut weight training around about ten days out, and that will that will not include though explosive power work and speed training, where I'll begin to cut that out around six days out from the fight. Now, if the fighter has little experience in the weight room, like just you know basically is a, either like a BJJ guy or something like that that's really never had, you know, experience lifting weights, uh, I'll make sure I'll cut that training out a little sooner. Um, so, you know, because he hasn't really adapted to the stimulus optimally and could cause soreness and, you know, cortisol release to hinder his weight cut and his skill-specific training. So, What is cortisol that, release? So basically when it, it's a stress hormone. So when, you know, when you're doing strenuous activity, something that your body's not really used to, like a weight training session or something along the lines of that, um, your body releases this stress hormone, which can cause weight gain or you know fat to be um, released or maintained in your body. Also, it just stresses out your body in general. So when you're trying to cut weight, you want to kind of minimize that as much as you possibly can. You know, so and they're already doing, you know, they're still drilling pretty hard but i like to have our skills coaches kind of cut that out as well we don't really want to be doing a lot of like heavy pad work and things like that that's going to cause more cortisol to uh hinder the weight cut if needed um so but the week of the fight it's it's all about drilling mobility work and, and short bouts of conditioning and that's and that's in a specific realm so it'll be like you know um grappling to a uh, ground and pound or something along the lines of that. If they're close in weight, then you can kind of push the envelope of that cortisol release, but you don't really want to hit it too hard. You see, for you people listening, do you see the knowledge here? I, cortisol release, I don't even know what that is. I'm learning here, <laughs> you're learning. Just really, just thank Phil. You know, you really should. It's just that amazing. But we're, we're not even done. We still have several, several questions to go. Um, next question is, from Chase Your Dreams 247 on Instagram, their question is, what is your opinion on the conjugate versus linear periodization? Now, before you get just scientific and blow our minds, can you just explain what each of them are? Because I don't know what either of those are. All right, so let's back up a little bit. Let me let me go ahead and explain both of these now. Yeah. But, you know, both of them have been proven to work. It just depends on the athlete and the circumstances. Mm-hmm. When I have fighters who get fights on short notice and are not regularly in contract with like the UFC or Bellator um, that have fights on, you know, short notice or they're getting called up to the USC, um, the conjugate approach is a good way to go. It's, it's to keep, you know, fighters physically ready to go at all times. But the conjugate system or method is basically circulating training focuses each training session in a given micro cycle or basically a training week. Um, it's, it was first brought to us by Yuri Bereshansky out in the Soviet, you old Soviet Union. He was a uh, he was a uh, track coach out there who actually um, basically invented the plyometrics. 
And uh, we talked about that in earlier podcasts. But if you want to check out Yuri Vershansky's work and Mel Sif, check out Super Training, the book Super Training. It's by far the best book I've read. It's a it's a it's a very it's a very tough read. Um, you know, you'll probably need like an encyclopedia or something by your side, but definitely it's good to have. And, and you definitely can learn a lot about programming there. Now, with that being said, it was made basically famous in America by Louis Simmons and Westside Barbell, which is like the strongest gym in the world right now for powerlifting and just strength sports in general. Um, now, each day is a different focus, like a max effort day for one, a dynamic day or dynamic effort day for two, and then like a volume effort day, which is basically hypertrophy or bodybuilding in a sense. Now, the theory is that when you train these sequences throughout a uh, throughout an entire mesocycle with a three to four week wave, um, it'll develop readiness for all demands. So, you know, you would basically do a max effort day on Monday, a dynamic effort day on Wednesday, and then a volume day on Friday. And then you would rotate them each week for about three weeks, and then you would have a deload week. Now, obviously, this isn't a weightlifting sport, so the exercise frequencies must meet the criteria of MMA or, you know, for the sport itself, for the, you know, the several bioenergetic demands of the sport. There's so many different aerobic systems in MMA. Um, so we want to make sure that we're, we're correlating the, that type of conjugate method around the aerobic capacity of the sport. Um, now, that a linear approach could work for beginner lifters like novice weightlifting training, things like that. Now, if a fighter has never lifted a weight a day in their life like those, you know, some like the BJJ guys or, you know, just anybody that's really never really been in the weight room um, and, you know, in general or who's a, uh, a traditional martial artist, um, you, you want to teach them some technique and accurate recovery methods they will, that will get them stronger and that will get them better. But that linear periodization is something that will actually help them. Um, it's nothing more than just progression in load through a given microcycle for, mm -hmm. you know, or each week mm -hmm. of the training. Now, like every week you would basically, you know, for upper body, you would add five pounds to your main lifts that you wanted to hit and the same goes for lower body you would just add 10 pounds instead of five instead so you know basically it's just increasing weight each week and just getting stronger each week they both work you just have to know you know what you're working with so conjugate is better for the person that's you know more experienced in in the weightlifting or a certain sure. time of exercise and linear is for the person that's getting into it and this is to build them up to almost build them up to conjugate I mean, you can build them with the conjugate, but you can also build them up to a nonlinear approach. There's a bunch of different, yeah. you know, programs and periodization models. But, yeah, I mean, linear is something that has been done and tried and proven for years. You know, there's a lot of new things out like daily undulated periodization, block periodization. And I do that. I do that, too, with some of my my higher level guys and girls like Yoani and Jacek will do a block periodization model because we know when she's going to fight. You know, if she's 12 weeks out or eight weeks out. Like Dustin Poirier, I have him on a uh, a 16 week cycle right now mm. on his um you know basically his off season because Eddie was too soft to take the fight. Um, yep, yep, yep. You know. So, anyways, you know, <laughs> we just we have to, we had to keep on rolling, baby. So, in my limp biscuit voice, keep on rolling, baby. I, that was like that was like you my like band of the early 2000s. <laughs> you a limp biscuit guy, Phil? Man, I ain't no Limp Bizkit. Oh, <laughs> like, I thought we were about to bond there on no, Limp Bizkit. No, I'm not going <laughs> Damn, you didn't have like the red backwards hat back in the day? I, I used to rock something like that. Look, <laughs> my wife just rolled her eyes at me, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, ne for our next question, Ryan from Charlotte asks, what are the top five supplements to take for an average person? An average person, I mean, just a general fish oil, omega-3, uh, probiotic for gut health. Um, and if you're training, you know, branched-chain amino acids, I do like some creatine and, uh, and some vitamin D3. I think those are the best, not in any specific order, but I think those are the best five that I can really attend to. And I, and I make sure that I take on a daily basis. Now, I, I, while doing research for a possible guest we were going to have, um, the yeah. you know, watching the interview, they, the guest was talking about how they weren't big on, the, you know, their strength and conditioning coach, and they mm. weren't big on supplements. They weren't against it, but they were just making the point 
um, yeah. that a, a nutritious diet is mm-hmm. just as important, and that kind of gets lost in it. Like I guess so many people just you know they they hear oh supplements supplements they think it's a big thing that's what you got to do that's a, a key a part of nutrition and fitness nowadays and 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 making yeah. the point about water and vegetables. That, do you subscribe to that kind of the thinking too? You know you need a base of a nutritious diet before even you even get to supplements. So there's a there's a um, a biochemist by the name of Rhonda. Kirkpatrick, I think her name is, or Patrick. She's been on she's been on uh, Joe Rogan's show a couple times, and but she does studies all about, and she does a lot of studies on vitamin D three deficiency, and um, and just other vitamins and nutrients and supplements. Now, what she was opposed of is like you know basically what we have now as far as food goes, we don't get enough nutrition in the food we have, you know. So it is you know optimal for us to at least get in some sort of vitamins and supplements to help take, you know, take the blunt of whatever we are missing in our, uh, in our foods. Now food sources are, you know, definitely tainted, um, from back in, you know, the day. So, I mean, you definitely, you know, you're not going to get all of your nutritional value from just your food. You need right. to make sure that you're getting some type of supplements and some vitamins in there. Um, but like I said, you, you know, I'm not opposed to having a nutrition diet and understanding that but you know there's always little things that you could do to help yourself yeah. and if that's the case then why not get the most out of what you, you you can buy out of a supplement now you know i'm not i'm not big into like pre-workout you know pre-workout drinks and things like that but um i do believe that you know a standard vitamin like vitamin d a vitamin b complex you know, uh, you know, amino acids, these things can be supplemented in because you don't get them in your daily diet. I don't care what people say. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, the next question, I hope I get this name right, is a very long name. New Josie Banega Saibe asks, when a mm. fighter is peaking for a match, what does his peaking in the gym look like? Is it similar to that of any other strength sport where conditioning takes a more prominent role? Uh, does a fighter train with block periodization, or does it look completely different from the iron sport? Yeah, and, and this is this is one of my boys from uh, my strongman days. But coming from both worlds, I can attest that it's somewhat similar. But he did say something that was not entirely accurate with MMA. And it's not prominent in one aerobic system. It's a mixture of all. So peaking becomes depicted on the fighter's strengths and weaknesses. So let's say if a fighter's a prim- primarily a better striker and has the aerobic capacity to run for miles, like a like a boxer would or a kickboxer, um, you know, then we must make sure that we are maintaining that aerobic capability, but. Also, we're going to improve on power and strength endurance outputs and that lactic threshold because they're not really they're, that's not their strong suit. So we want to make sure we're getting that. If a fighter is a grappler, for instance, um, has tremendous lactic threshold because they do rounds on rounds. You know how you know. And I, I see these guys on a daily basis with their wrestling man, and they'll go in there and they'll grind it out. And I, if I wrestled in high school, you know, so I can completely understand where they get that that conditioning from. Um, but that but that response lacks solid VO2, which is basically your your oxygen uptake, how much oxygen that you can actually hold, you know. So you don't get that a lot from just you know your standard lactic conditioning. Um, we we need to make sure that we're bringing that up as well from a grappler standpoint. And now with that being said, you know, yes, I'll always drop volume and raise intensity while lowering the frequency. Um, high bursts of high intensity intervals. Um, for the aerobic cap- you know, for the aerobic capacities and circuit training for the lactic conditioning. So the circuits can be like, you know, one minute bouts of uh, of any type of exercise that makes sense for the specific specificity for the sport. Um, so, you know, it could be anything with battle ropes, farmers walks, um, hammer slams, tire flips. I like those, you know, um, now the only difference is these fighters are not lifters, so the specificity the specificity must become primarily on their skills work. So at that time, a lot of sparring, grappling, etc., will start to start to raise and and less on that full strength training in the gym or in the weight room. Now, 
You mentioned uh, lactic. Now, I mean, a lot of fans will hear it, you know, on UFC broadcasts, even Bellator broadcasts, whatever broadcasts, and Joe Rogan talks about it here, lactic acid, lactic acid. Oh, look at the lactic acid build, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, fans have, a, I think, a general idea, but, yeah. you know, you're the expert. Could you explain what lactic acid is? You mentioned lactic uh, lactic threshold. Like, why mm. is, you know, that a key element of when a person, you know, is ex- exerting themselves and how it affects the body? Well, I mean, without getting all scientific on them, you know, basically what what happens is when your body um, does a certain movement or a certain exercise for a long period of time, they begin to develop acidosis in the muscle tissue. And what it feels like is that is that your body is basically just burning down and, and has no energy left for ATP regeneration. So. The one thing, like we said, we'll go back to the earlier uh, question with the uh, with the supplements is that creatine supplementation can actually help the reuptake of ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. It's one of the uh, main energy sources for your body to to actually do work. So once your body goes through that that mode of, you know, exhaustion, um, there's basically a breakdown. You can't you feel like you cannot move. Now, a lot of it's not there's not there's no such thing is real lactic acid mm-hmm. um it's a it's kind of a a, a misnomer a made up name mm-hmm. but it's basically acidosis mm-hmm. um is is what the function is called and basically what you're feeling is a lot of blood flow to the to the surrounding muscle tissue coming away from the heart into the working tissue which causes you know you to basically you know want to fall on the floor <laughs> now, when you see it in fighters, now tell me if this is, you know, the lactic acidosis or maybe it's just a fight. But you see when a fighter does a lot of grappling, especially if they're of the lighter complexion, and you'll see that reddishness on their shoulders, chest, you know, sure. upper back. Is is that lactic acidosis, you know, happening or is just that's how the guy gets, you know, flush when he's... Well, that's, that's actually the blood flow to the surrounding tissue. Mm-hmm. So... If you ever had like a nitric oxide booster from like a supplement store or something like that, you begin to see like your body will get like really red and feel tingly and things like that. Mm. Now that has also to do with beta alanine. But other than that, you know, basically what what, uh, lifters in the gym will call a pump, Mm. basically that's what's going on. The blood is going into the tissue causing that redness and fullness to happen. Mm. All right. Now our next question. Wait a minute. This question is from from Jason Burgos. What? How, how familiar? Uh-oh. Where did what? Did, <laughs> now, so you know, it was announced on Friday night that one of the fighters you train, close friend, and we mentioned it, Connecticut, King Mo has a date and opponent set for his next fight. Uh, he will face Liam McGeary at Bellator 185, I believe it is, in October. Uh, before I ask about his opponent, uh, why do you think? Why, why don't you think Mo got the next shot at fighting Ryan Bader for like, the light heavyweight title? You know, especially since he was gonna fight him at Bellator NYC before he had to pull out due to an injury. I was I was surprised by that match. I figured Mo would be next in line for a title shot. What are your thoughts on that? I think a lot of that has to do with politics, man. You know, um, the real reason right now. I, I think I think Liam is a better fight for us. And I think that, um, you know, Liam really knows Mo well. They're friends, you know, outside of, you know, the fight game. Yeah. But it's it's a better matchup as of right now. But, I mean, Bader would have been a good matchup too, you know what I mean? But we, we're looking for Bader. You know, after after this fight, we'll probably get him. And then, you know, we'll see from there. But I, I think it just has to come down to politics and, and timing, you know. And, and, you know, Bellator treats Mo you know, fairly well. So, I mean, yeah. it may just be the fact that they know that they can beat, we can beat Liam, you know what I mean? So if that's the case, then we'll go ahead, knock him out the way and uh, go on to better get that belt. Now, what, what's your scouting report? What would, how would you scout a guy like Liam McGeary? Like, what are your thoughts on him? And what, do you think you'll do, you know, add anything different to most training than you had before for an opponent like me Liam McGeary or it's you know stay the course with what's been working already yeah I mean most so he's he's a veteran I mean so I don't really have to worry about what he's thinking about other opponents and he doesn't really even care he knows Liam so well that he knows what he's going to do before he does it mm-hmm. um for me from a physical preparation standpoint I leave it up to the skills coaches to learn and and adapt to you know his his um his training for that but for me it's just to get him ready and capable to go three or five rounds whatever the case may be 
you know, and um, get him stronger, get him more powerful. You know, his core stability is there. His uh, his range of motion now is even better than ever. You know, after the thing with his hip, um, and his and his and he's moving way better now. So I mean, I'm I'm really excited. He feel I feel like this is the old Mo, and um, for me personally, you know, we get to push it a little bit harder now in training because we don't have those those um, those crutches there, you know, or those or those that dysfunction that was holding us back from uh, doing going 100 percent. How much interaction do you have like as a strength coach with, you know, his other coaches, his skill coaches? Is there like any kind of, you know, directive they they yeah. they tell you they think you should, you know, think about, they'd like you to work on or do you you personally for, for a fighter like Mo or even fighter any other fighter that do you kind of review them, their physicality at that moment, how they're looking, how they're feeling, how they are and then go from there, you know, what is the interaction level with any other the other coaches there? Uh, well, for me and the fighters, we have more interaction just based upon, you know, I'm working with them year round from a from a physical preparation standpoint, nutrition standpoint, recovery standpoint, you know, um, and we talk about things as far as getting their body prepared for battle. So um, as far as the coaches go, you know, we have a, a, a great communication between coaches. I think that, you know, with all of the fighters in the gym and all the coaches in the gym. Um, it's it's a blessing to have all coaches under one roof, you know, but from that perspective, you know, we also want to make sure that they're they're getting what they need at the right times, you know, and the assessment processes is every day. You know, we I assess I assess uh, movement patterns and movement capabilities and dysfunction, you know, before they start the program. But then my, my assessments don't stop from there. Every day is a new assessment, watching them in their dynamic stretches and through their movement patterns. You know, the way they're moving and running, um, even when they're sparring or grappling, I'll take a look at that, making sure that they're, you know, moving efficiently uh, for the sport and for just longevity. Now, I have to ask, it was a story of the week, and we're trying to get we get some diversity on the show. I now, know. we had we had the May, Mayweather-McGregor promotion this yeah. week. Um, like, what is your opinion? I mean, you, you or just, you know, what is the thought? I mean, was it conversation at American Top Team? Like, what is your opinion on that kind of promotion? Like, four days in a row, four different cities, cursing, yeah. borderline racist, borderline <laughs> homophobic. Now, it wasn't even borderline. It was homophobic. You know, what is your thoughts as a fighter, you know, as a, as a coach, you know, as a fan of, of something like that? Do you like it? Do you not? Yeah. What's your thoughts? I think it was a bit overkill. I think with with the boxing press conferences, I think it's a little bit um, – it's not organized whatsoever. I think UFC does a great job of organizing their press conferences now that I've seen what, what was going on there. It was a true shit show, like Dana said. <laughs> you know, I mean, you got guys calling – they even ran out of shit to say. Yeah. Like, they didn't even know what they were saying. I, I, think, I think at one point, you know, I watched like a uh, – basically a spoof video of of them making fun of making fun of um of Floyd because all he was saying was yeah. yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like he fucking forgot anything he was going to say. And I mean McGregor he does come with like a good amount of good he goes with good material. He's got he's pretty witty. Yeah. Uh but like even then it was overkill like how much can you say, how much yep. shit can you talk to one person for four days straight yeah. for an hour? You know what I mean? So I think that it was definitely uh, something that, that needs to be dialed down a little bit. I mean, it was cool while it lasted, I guess. It got people interested. Um, you know, the casual fans will like it. But as far as the hardcore MMA and the hardcore boxing fans, I've got nothing but like they don't even want to hear about it right now. You know what I mean? So the boxing fans, the boxing enthusiasts hate it. The MMA fans, the MMA enthusiasts are are for it, but are still kind of skeptical about, you know, what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of that's not so great. You know, you want to make you you want to make I think it'll be good for both sports just for the notoriety. It'll be a, like I said another shit show. It'll be, you know, almost like a WWE match. Um, because that's what it basically is, man. I mean, you got one guy going into a sport he really never even, you know, competed in. And then you got an aging 
legend, you know, who's fighting a guy that's unorthodox and is the, arguably one of the best in his own sports. So, I mean, it, it is a show, but at the end of the day, if you're going to pay for it, just make sure you go to a bar. I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend any money on it. You know, I, well, I, I didn't watch it. You know, a lot of the, the stuff I follow on the social media is the MMA base, so you, you're you're almost stuck seeing it. And it's funny how like they had everybody interested the first couple of days, and then by the second couple of days, it's it just like everybody wanted them to go away. And the yeah. the, the funny thing, and it, it boggles my mind, and we talked about it a little bit with Mo. Is that the fans that are buying it? That are buying into it? It's it's you you said it perfect. It's a guy getting into a sport he's never done before. Like you'll see in a lot of you'll see basketball games that they're you know glowing over LeBron James and his athleticism, mm. and it's like oh LeBron, you know he's the kind of guy he could probably go into football. He could probably play t- tight end in the NFL. Yeah, he he might you know just like Connor might be able to go boxing, but you don't put. LeBron into the Super Bowl or the AFC Championship game starting against a good team, you know, and that's why yeah. it's ridiculous. And the, the fact yeah. that, you know, people are so involved and, and care about it is mind boggling. But so, suffice to say, you will not be spending $100 on May Mac in August. No, not at all. <laughs> Would you even. I mean, listen, listen, yeah. listen. And, 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 you know, to Connor's credit, man. He started really from just a, you know, pretty much an undercard fighter mm. to now being basically one of the one of the most wealthiest MMA fighters in the game yeah. in history. You yeah. know, so I, I can't get mad at him for that. I can't really get mad at for that him for that for that hustle. Um, and I can't get mad at Floyd for wanting a payday, an easy payday, you know, so it is what it is. Now, would you even waste time watching an illegal stream of it? Um, I plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, now, I'm I mean, not going to do it, it on Pride. I, I just, I, mean, I don't want to watch it. Like, I'll watch it, um, you know, for, I mean, I'll watch it, but I mean, I'm not going to be like totally into it. I yeah. may be on my phone or something yeah, yeah. like that, but I'm not going to be like totally into it, eating popcorn and drinking a beer <laughs> or some shit. Like, I'll probably be on my computer doing work or something. I don't yeah. know. All right, now that that's all our questions. I'm sure, without a doubt, Phil, you know, just dropped a whole bunch of knowledge on you. You know, conjugate, Ooh. linear, lactic. What was the other one? The cortisol. The cortisol. <laughs> I, I mean, God, these are words just, I did just, not even know before today. Just uh, open up a uh, basic biochemistry book or biomechanics book or physiology. I don't, I don't book. like that stuff. That stuff more. No. You can do it, man. <laughs> basics, 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 baby, basics. Now, 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 now listen though. Yeah. Now, this is, I'm gonna go ahead and make an announcement right now. Oh. In the next episode. Mm-hmm. Be prepared. Uh uh-uh. uh. Be dropping some major knowledge bombs. Really. Major. Yeah. A guy that's way smarter than your boy. Wow. Not saying he. Not saying you know. Listen. I got practical application on my side, plus a little bit of science. Mm-hmm. And you got it's, the muscles, so if anybody got problems, you drop it down. Ready to go, and and I and you know, and I'm strong, so yeah. that works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but no, this uh, this next uh, this next guest is going to be really good. So I'm pretty excited from a coach's standpoint. I'm pretty excited about it. I mean, is there a better setup? Like, like this is like watching, you know, that show that that Phil just loved, you know, Game of Thrones. Phil big on Game of Thrones because you know Vikings is a whack show, but like Game of you Thrones, like you see that right <laughs> you Stop watch Game that mess, man. <laughs> you watch Game of Thrones, and then after the show ends, they, they show you, oh, this is gonna happen next week. The Phil just gave you the what's gonna happen next week. How how do you not want to come back for that? I don't I don't know. But Phil, please give them. Your your social medias, the Instagrams, the 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 Twitter, Facebook, anywhere people can follow you if they haven't done it by watching the first. I mean, listening to the first few episodes already. Okay, so Instagram Daru Strong, Twitter is Daru Strong. Check me out on Snapchat at Daru Strong One, and then if you want to hit me up on Facebook, hit me on the inbox. Um, go ahead and just. Find my name, Phil Bam Bam Daru, with my fight name. And then uh, if you're looking for online programming, go to DaruStrong.com and uh, hit me on my email there, and we can get started. Do you have any other other, other projects or things? Are there any other like competitions coming up or any other mm-hmm. things you're working on? Yeah, we got a bunch. I mean, I got uh, in September, I have another meet, powerlifting meet there. Um, and then, you know, as far as fighters go, 
I mean, we got a couple coming up, you know, local guys coming up in the regional scene. Um, and then, you know, waiting on the the announcement for either Robert Whiteford and then something with JJ in the works and then also Dustin Poirier. So we got, you know, pretty in this next couple months, we're going to be pretty booked. All right. Now, uh, for me, uh, you can follow me in Cheap Seats Chat on Twitter, on Instagram, Jericho Vendetta. Now, don't forget, we have the podcast Facebook page at Fight Strength Podcast. You can look us up. We are also on Twitter, Fight Strength underscore. Please follow us. Remember, you can listen to previous episodes of the show, Google Play, SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes. Rate us. Give us a rating. Let us know what you think. Comment. You know, if you watch the YouTube video or wherever, comment what you think, like, share, please. Uh, that is our show. You know Phil already gave you a good reason to come back next week because you like some knowledge. You're going to get more of it. I am Jason Burgos. He is Phil Duru. See you next time, everybody. <laughs>